All right, Mr. Bernstein, take us Here away. Here we are, Sunday, March 12th, and 2023, and this is the Tinderbox Week uh, Meetup. Uh, I'm Mark Bernstein, the developer of Tinderbox. Today I'm going to be in and out, uh, lots of stuff happening at Eastgate World Headquarters. Uh, but uh, here's Michael Becker. Hey, everybody. Um, typical format for our meetups. Uh, we go around the table, introduce new people. We have none today. Uh, we then talk about any projects we're working on and then dig into any themed uh, pro uh, projects for the day. We don't have any themed projects either as well. So we're just going to go in and have an ad hoc conversation and see uh, where it takes us. So let's jump in. Who's who's working on what? And do you have any uh, suggested projects? I actually have one that I could use your help with, Mark. Um, but before we dig in on that, I want to um, uh, you know get your get your feedback. So let's see who else has any other thoughts, comments, questions. I'll I'll throw out something on, on separators, and and I guess um, they're kind of a, a historical feature now. I use them principally as an appearance thing to, to hide elements of a tinderbox file. Um, I don't know that they offer any uh, special utility other than that. I mean, um, is there an, is that their chief function these days? The intended function of uh, the separator was to decorate outlines in much the way that adornments decorate maps. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, it, sometimes a section of an outline is essentially a list, and it can be nice to separate the list into sublists uh, without actually uh, making the sublist a separate level of the outline, which in s some cases is just bad. Uh, through a, mista a coding mistake, it turned out that you could put uh, notes inside of an adornment. And this immediately was seized upon as a notation for this is actually a container, but you shouldn't be concerned sorry, with what's sorry, inside. Sorry, Mark, notes inside a separator or notes inside an adornment? Note, notes inside a separator. Got it. Misspoke. Uh, you shouldn't concern yourself, for example, a place to talk away infrastructure, uh, which I gather is how you're currently using them most often. And, uh, yes. But I don't um, need to do that. Yeah, I, 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 it's fine. Is... It's not going to go away. Uh, and um, there is a small detail now being discussed that separators and adornments uh, don't export because, generally speaking, don't export by default because if you're exporting a website, you don't expect your background ornaments or your list separators to export as separate web pages. Um, Unfortunately, there is some wiring in the designators for next sibling and previous sibling, which automatic automatically skips over separators and adornments. Uh, this it is less clear that that's actually what you, one would expect them to do, as often you're doing it in contexts that have nothing at all to do with whether you're being exported or not. And so that may change. Um, it would be a breaking change to change the semantics, which I really try to avoid. But I think that I probably personally know everyone whose templates I'm going to break in the process. And um, so we can probably get away with that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to break mine. And, and it'll break Mark Anderson's, but only in one place, which <laughs> is not too bad. Now, if I'm not mistaken, so yeah, so so, so what you're saying is the uh, these the 
the separator does not get a sibling order. No, actually, no. Here's here it, yeah. it does so, get a sibling well, order. It, it does, and that and so this broke a bunch of scripts that I had earlier, actually. And I wanted to talk to you about this now that we're bringing it up. So I was doing some child counting, and this separator one two four, right? And I didn't want that separator actually part of the count. And so I was having trouble getting around that. Is that what we're working on or talking about? Oh, uh, no, because that separator is, in fact, uh, in the outline. And you might well expect it to be. And it's easy enough, especially now that we have functions, to write a child count that would uh, remove the separators or to, in fact, count the separators in a container. So you could... Uh, do child count minus separator count. Yeah, no, but I was actually trying to do something more dynamic where the, the numbering of the notes was based on, on on sibling number. And if the separators moved around, that would change the numbering of the notes. Uh, and that's, but we don't have to talk about that right now, but that, that was causing issues. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, Dave, did you get your comment or question resolved or addressed? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. <laughs> I wasn't. Okay. I have some point, something that's a bit arcane, but let's let others go first. Um, anybody else have anything? And then I can ask my arcane question. All right. Why don't I ask my... I'm sorry, go ahead. Isn't that why you run these meetings? So you get to ask these arcane questions? Well, I try to do it offline, though, because then, you know, people get mad at me because I ask, like, stupid stuff that confuses people. And so uh, let me show you what I'm trying to do, see if I can pull it up so I don't break any confidentiality here. Uh, communications. Okay. Um, all right. So here's a file I'm working on right now. And... I'm in the process of, of organizing an event in, um, uh, I'm actually, it's kind of interesting. I'm in the process of organizing an event in, in May. And so the way I'm going about doing it is I'm creating my run a show. I'm going to be creating different, um, you know, timing. So I'm tracking the timing for, you know, how long different elements of the show will go through. I'm also tracking who's going to be speaking on, uh, on what event. And so, for example, when you look at a particular session, my what my templates are doing is pulling in the details for the show um, and then dropping in what the abstract for the talk's going to be and then all of the information for who's going to be speaking um, on the show. And then so that so then what I'm able to do with that is run a template and then I can go ahead and share this output with the prospective speakers. So for every session. We'll have a word document or you know, a document that we'll be able to iterate against and, and work on. Some of the other fun things I started dealing with, which was kind of interesting, is um, so here are all the speakers I've linked using my action code. The speakers automatically to the um, to the event names, and then I created myself a um, a, a stamp. Uh, which basically goes through and collects the email addresses of the speakers. So now if I apply that stamp, I can go ahead and copy that stamp. And then if I have an email open, which I'll do right now, I can go ahead and just paste that in. And I've basically co copied all of the, the email addresses of the speakers that actually exist. And now I can start emailing. So I find things like this to be really effective. So what I then started to do is I have an Apple script here, this one. And if I run, if I go ahead and select, for example, general communications, and I'll grab like, I don't know, I'll just grab this one, like one one I did with Kevin, maybe, or Nick North, right? So I'll kind of grab this one, and then I'll, and then if I go ahead and where'd my Apple script go? If I now go ahead and run the Apple script against uh, the this email with that note being selected. Uh, Tinderbox runs the Apple script and automatically creates an email and populates it with the text. So now, uh, so I'm getting close to being able to essentially email out of Tinderbox. Likewise, if I have like my, um, my marketing copy, where's my marketing copy, uh, associated with the event, um, 
Like, let's say I've got this marketing copy here that's associated with the event. If I then run that Apple script as well, I can go ahead and do this. And it actually pulls up and gives me, you know, and interjects HTML and all that. Now, one thing I, I did, Mark, that you taught me is I put this image up on my web server. So what's actually happening is it's pasting in the URL to the image on my web server and then resolving that into the email. And that's how I'm getting around the local file issue. Um, <clears throat> one issue I have, though, is I don't know why it's if you look at my template, the template has the image on the top. But for some reason, the email email is in pulling that image and sticking it on the bottom. I, not that that's an issue, but I uh, you're at, you're on mute. Yeah, uh, that that that's undoubtedly a detail of the email that you're exporting. Uh, I think it's Zeldman has a proverbial saying that the only way to find out what an email will look like when the recipient receives it, an HTML email, is to actually open it on their machine. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure it's related to the style sheet. Well, what's interesting is the image is here. So I've got in, in the style sheet, if you look in the template, I've got the image mm -hmm. on the top. But for some reason, when it's getting imported into the content, it's it's being inserted on the bottom, which is really weird. And I'm not I'm not trying to get that solved. What I'm trying to get solved is this. So I'm, I, I just kind of gave a long preamble of everything that I'm kind of playing around with here. So I can launch this script from uh, from the script editor and it works great and it's perfect. Now, what I want to do, though, is I want to be able to launch this script from a stamp. And so where are my stamps? So if I go here and I created a proof email and for, for whatever reason, this isn't working. And so if I take that exact same script and include and include uh, and, he and here's the exact same Apple script as a note in Tinderbox uh, for whatever reason that I can't figure out uh, here it is. Um, and at one point I had this, I had, I thought, I think I had this as dot JSON originally. Um, whenever I try to run the stamp, it doesn't work. So I'm not sure I'll, what I'm doing wrong. I'll get Tinderbox out of the way. I'll open up a terminal, run this from the terminal piping, whatever you is in text of email three script uh, into uh, your script and I'll debug it there. Got it. So what I basically do is run this and then pass it pass that or something like that. Oh, uh, that's pass the text of that. Yeah, cat that into standard in. Oh, uh, sorry, cat the text into the standard in of user bin OSA script. Got uh, it. And uh, the argument is. Uh, uh, the script.json will be passed as an argument to uh, OSA script and oh no, no, you don't want the script.json. That's a that's a file. Right. So what so um, so that I, I assume that was wrong. But that still doesn't work. Yeah, but 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 this isn't a Tinder box thing. Just no, debug okay. it on the command line. Got it. All right. Maybe um, Roger Alexander can help me later. But so just as an FYI, though, that's kind of interesting is I'm nearly close to being able to like write and write and send my emails from Tinderbox. OK. Anybody other thoughts, comments, questions? Mr. Chuck, did you raise your hand? So along, along those lines. Uh, has anybody in the Tinderbox community ever worked directly with um, what used to be called mail handler files, you know, which is the sort of Unix standard file structure for storing um, email folders and um, email inboxes and things like that? Uh, I'm just curious if, if anybody's ever tackled that problem. I have not. 
Oh, <laughs> uh, there uh, an old heavy tinderbox user, Doug Miller in Indianapolis may have. Oh, uh, but oh, uh, tinderbox is an email client frightens me. <laughs> it would As well, it me should. Again years Chuck, ago what are you we trying to less, do? When you, we were worth, less worried about security. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I have the, you know, so much of my life is documented in email. I've just used email for a very long time. And um, so I've got three decades worth of correspondence that's mostly related to projects and technology. And it's grouped, it's organized into folders. And there are some instances where I'd like to be able to uh, process those folders within Tinderbox to pull out items of interest that are otherwise <clears throat> difficult to search for in your standard email client. So it's it's just a, something I've been thinking about. And I was just wondering if there's anybody I could correspond with who might've already done it. I, on that note, though, wouldn't DevonThink be a better tool for that? You you essentially have DevonThink look at all the email folders, and then you could use DevonThink to search against them. Maybe um, th there is an import export tool for um, uh, Thunderbird, which will produce an HTML equivalent of everything in an email folder, and I, I fooled around with that. That actually works fairly well and can work either with uh, Tinderbox or with um, DevonThink. Um, but I was just thinking, you know, why go through the extra conversion step? Um, it's all there is one gigantic text file, which is what an MH file is. And I was just thinking through that it should be feasible to um analyze that using you know a, a tool like devon think could do some of it but um what i'm really looking to do is to extract information that can be used for knowledge assessment um which is tinderbox's forte so i was kind of thinking um, about pulling Chuck, that into tinderbox do you have mh or mbox files i kind of view being the same there i realize there are some differences but um, it's it's the standard um, mail file that almost well everybody but Outlook tends to use. Uh, well, okay, so th there's actually a difference between those two, which is why I sort of uh, okay. noticed what it was. Um, so there was a system called MH that came out of originally from Rand, um, right? Uh, and uh, the the storage format there is one file per message. So in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, working with it is really, really easy um, yeah, right. because it's just the text file of the email. Uh, and it only got complicated when we started doing MIME attachments to email. Um, and mm -hmm. so there's some processing you would have to do to, to uh, extract HTML um, or images out of that. Um, but there mm -hmm. are command line tools that do that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, uh, and then there's the old um, uh, Unix uh, inbox format, uh, mostly mm -hmm. from Berkeley, although it may have been also just used for, on the original Unix systems as well, um, uh, which is a folder is a single file of all of the messages in the folder concatenated together um, uh, with a very simple parsing rule, um, which is that uh, the, uh, the word from um, uh, yes. at the beginning of the line is the separator. Uh, yes. Um, uh, if I were going to approach the stuff for Tinderbox, say, um, or even for DevonThink, um, what I might actually do is, if I've got inbox files, convert them to MH format, um, for which there are, are tools, um, because yep. then you've got the individual files, uh, mm -hmm. and those are Again, aside from the um, multimedia components, <laughs> sort of trivial to work with in all of these things. You could easily translate that into, like if you wanted to import them into notes and make all the mail headers uh, attributes of it, uh, the, uh, it just cranks for a while and then you've got all that stuff. Um, if it's yeah. interesting, whether or not that working with it later does what you want is a different question, but that would yeah. be a scheme yeah. for it. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's where I was getting a little bit uh, confused. I was thinking of M, MH because it had the simpler structure, 
um, but also probably I was getting mixed up inbox being converted into MH or inbox being converted into HTML, which is what that import export utility I was referring to does. Right. Um, you know, so it's just, again, I just like I said, I was just poking to see if anybody in the community had worked on this problem and uh, was just looking to perhaps share some experience or do some experiments with somebody that, uh, you know, had had an interest in the topic. Uh, and actually, giving it another few seconds thought, uh, even importing inbox files into Tinderbox and splitting them uh, at the from line um, would, yeah, would be a would perfectly work. fine way to do it. Right. It, it, they're very easy to parse in that sense, which is sort of an old Unix virtue. Which is also one of the reasons why from keeps getting caught by various uh, yep. <laughs> systems that think, oh, you must mean an, an email. <laughs> If a line starts with from, expect problems. I, in the er earlier days of the web, it was really funny because you saw all kinds of web pages that had um, from obliterated because it had been misassumed to be part of an email. Uh, and, and technically the separator is from space so yeah, that from, the, space. from colon headers um, are not uh, mangled right. uh, in things. Right. But yes, in the text of the email, you'd get a um, <clears throat> carrot at the beginning. Not a carrot, greater than sign. Right, right. Cool. Um, yes, Mr. Gale, and then I got to ask. Hi, good morning. Um, something that Chuck just mentioned um, triggered a thought for me. Some of you I know are using Tinderbox for um, blogs and even website development. Um, a colleague of mine was just settled a lawsuit with an attorney, an ADA type attorney for about $15,000. And she's redoing her website because it wasn't considered to be ADA compliant. I've been researching this a bit because I have a feeling there's a 15 employee rule on, on, on this type of thing. Um, but it's a whole, I've, I've been communicating with the um, section, what is it, section 508 um, board, I think it's called the access board within uh, the government uh, office of civil rights to try and gather what is the quintessential current standards and to whom do they apply? Um, you know, so for people who are deaf or blind, um, what, what, what is required? I looked at her website and it's terrible. Um, I think it's from 2005 or 2009. So it's understandable that there aren't things in there like alt um, image tags and so forth and other and, and scalable fonts. But I guess I'm just wondering for those of you who are using Tinderbox, because I've um, I've been intrigued by that idea of using it to create the HTML and then pop that into the website. Does anybody have any thoughts about that particular, um, you know, potential area of risk or liability, or does anyone know anything about that? I think you would just need somebody who is conversant in the ADA requirements to help you develop the export templates. Um, you just need to have tell Tinderbox what needs to go where to have a compliant website. I, I don't worry about it because it's a blog. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, I, he's right. So there's there's a bunch of ADA resources you can go to, but having Tinderbox <laughs> populate the required alternate fields and all of that is a frankly, a trivial matter. You just got to know what you need to do and then tell Tinderbox to do it. You know, and then once you've set up the template once, you never need to think about it again. It would just happen automatically. I actually started using Tinderbox to populate alt tags and and things like that, posters for videos, and it, it works really, really well. Sounds like an offline conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, again, it's just, it's, it goes back to our templating discussion. It's just, some, it, it's, once you've built a template, it's really easy. And um, maybe that's part of the conversation we can have today is, you know, going back to templating 101 and, and wrapping our heads around that and just kind of experimenting with that and showing, for example, that could be a, a, a demo we do today is, you know, dropping in an alt tag into an image. And, you know, and maybe we experiment, you know, that could be a fun way to demonstrate a template today. Well, and, and I, it may simply be much of that uh, ADA stuff is CSS related. Uh, which, you know, Tinderbox, you can do it in Tinderbox, but 
um, you could do it as a separate file anyway. So yeah, you're, but, and it is. It's like color schemes and the and the shade of gray or that you use, and you know, if someone's colorblind. Yes, exactly. Like, the amount of that contrast, default, that kind of thing. Right. That and that that's not really an export issue per se. No, it, it, again, it's it's the way you code the page. It's like in this context, use this color, or to your point, have the fallback CSS that the, that the website would would you know, would revert back to. But yeah, that would be pretty straightforward. Thanks. That's that's useful. Okay, uh, but we could do that quick little demo on like uh, yeah uh, you know. Give me five minutes. We can, you know, what does it take to create an ADA compliant, you know, image tag? Michael, did, did I hear correctly? Did you say the words quick and little? Yeah. And you're going to do it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, I'll just take, check. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Go get your coffee, Bruce. <laughs> Go get the coffee tree. <laughs> you uh, you read my mind. Well, that, that's an interesting thing because the biggest challenge on alt text is determining what to write to an image, a vision impaired person, i.e. a blind person. What, how do you describe a photograph? You know, I, 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 I put the alt tag text in there and I make a good faith effort to do it, but you know, a, a little blue hair and perched on a dead tree against the blue sky. I mean, what reference do they have to any of that? I, I have no idea. So, yeah, that's an interesting point. Okay, I just make it. I just make it descriptive. You know, people sitting in a coffee shop using their computers. Something, something along those lines. Well, All right, Dave Rogers' point is is the whole issue of context. I had a French aunt who was blind, had gone blind in World War II. She was a civilian, no access to medications for a civilian. The word collaboration, which is in vogue here today, was not to be used in her presence. So context is a slippery, slippery beast. <laughs> All right. So why don't we, why don't, Bruce, why don't we just have fun with that and just play with that a little bit? So let's say we wanted to bring an image into a Tinderbox file and we wanted to create a little web page. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to do it from, there's, as we've talked about before, there's a variety, of, and we actually brought it up briefly um, at the beginning of this call. So um, when we talked about doing images. So let's say you had a Tinderbox file here and we've got a note, and we'll call this an image. And for the lack of a better term, so like right here, I've just, I just randomly pulled up an ADA compliance tips website just out of, out of curiosity. And you see this website has an image right here. So if you copy the image address, if you right mouse click on that and copy the ima image address, that's one way of, of pulling in an image. So if you had HTML, and let's go ahead and create a template. So I'm going to go up to file templates and we'll create a basic HTML template in Tinderbox now. And I put that in just by going to the file menu and cl clicking HTML. And now I've got the basic HTML template that we'll mess around with and, and modify. Um, so if I, and then let's give this, this uh, let's call this one a home page. We'll call this one first page. Okay. So we've got a note here that we're calling the home page is our home page and then we've got a note here that this is our page with an image okay all right and um and then let's go ahead and we'll say here's an image all right all right so, ah. image okay so we've got some some notes and let's say in in this context we have a url i'm playing i'm just playing around here so let's say we have a URL here and we want, um, let's hard code that URL first in this image and we'll start with the homepage. So on the top of the item, the way you go about, if you go to WC3 schools, so let's go find that real quick. W3C schools, image tag. So if you do a search 
for WC3 schools and you come up with what does it take to properly encode an image in a web page. Um, this is uh, the core, this is the way to do it. So essentially what the elements that HTML needs to be able to populate an image is it needs the source, where is the image, that needs alt text, and it needs a width and a height. Um, and it will, uh, and the height is kind of, you know, you know, if you don't have width and height, it will just take the raw dimensions that the that are being served from the image. If you only provide one or the other, it will scale proportionally. And if you provide both, it will it will force the the proportionality. So let's go ahead and copy this, and we'll paste that right into our Tinderbox note. So we're going to put a template. So what we're going to say is we want an image to go right in there, and we have that URL that I copied here. So I'm going to go and hard code that into the page. So right now we're going to say the source of our image is that URL. So what we're doing is we're telling Tinderbox, go out to the, this website and pull this image from its source. And uh, let's go ahead and call this ADA, uh, ADA compliance tip. ADA compliance tips blog as a uh, picture. And we're gonna remove the width and stuff right now. And we'll experiment, we'll see what happens. So now if I go up to here and I click preview and it doesn't show up and it doesn't show up for a very specific reason because Tinderbox is defaulted to this note being shown by the temp using the template preview and not the HTML template that we just put in. So now if I do that, you'll see that Tinderbox is now pulling in that image. Okay, and then if we go back to our template and we put back in the sizes and let's go delete the height so we can just force it to be 500 width and review it. I've now forced that, that image to be a 500 width. And if you look at the export code, you'll see right there, it's imported in the alt text that we've provided. Does that make sense? Yeah, question. Under first page, why do you have a page that says image? Uh, because I was just experimenting. I, it was a place for me to park this URL to, so I had it later. Okay. Right. Um, and there's and there are other ways to do that. So let's say I do this. Let's say uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mess around with the with the, the code a little bit, a little bit. So let's leave that image there. So you see, I've got this image right here, right? Now mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to just so we get a different image. I'm going to grab this guy's picture. Um. That one doesn't look like it's giving it going to be friendly. Let's grab this one. I'll copy. Can't copy that either. I copy. Copy image address. So I'm not going to copy this guy's logo just for fun. Okay, and I'm going to use. I'm going to put the logo here, and we're going to call this one ADA Clients Tips Logo. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I've got that as an attribute. And now let's add a string. And we're gonna uh, actually let's just let's create a user attribute to make it sense. Um, image alt text. So we're gonna go ahead. Oops. Image alt text. So this is where the power of attributes come into play. So now we're gonna go ahead and create this attribute as a string. So now we have a user generated attribute called image alt text. And Michael, I'm gonna go ahead and put the URL. image. You've, you have misspelled image. Yeah, it happens in my in my world. I misspell. Yes, shuttle. but it, this this is gonna bite you downstream, right? I, I know, I know. I'm glad you brought it up. So, um, picky, picky. Yeah. Okay, I should be able to. There we go. There we go. Okay. And again, the beauty of Tinderbox is you can uh, fix stuff like that pretty easily. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say. We're gonna put the alt text here. This is the ADA compliance tips website logo. Okay, probably shouldn't have capitalization there. Okay, so that's the alt text that we wanna have um, for our, uh, our image. So now if we go back to our 
And let's take it even a step further and we'll call this one image width. And we'll make that a string as well. And we'll call this one 500. So now if I take this text here and I'm gonna now put this one here. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say value um, URL. And I'm gonna say value image alt text, right? I will copy that and we'll say value image width. So now what we've done is we're putting in the, it, rather than hard coding the values for um, our image, we're basically gonna grab the values we want associated with that image from the um, attribute values. So now if we do that and we go and populate the page, you'll now see the, the values for that export code are coming from the attribute values. And you know, obviously this logo is too big, we wouldn't wanna do that. So let's go ahead and say, it, make it like 200. So then we go like that and then we got a smaller logo. And it's really, it's as easy as that. Now you can also, you know, in, in, you, can compl you can complicate it more by, you know, pulling, you know, if you wanted to have this image rather than this image coming from your, um, a URL, let me pull up my hard drive here and have this coming from, uh, yeah, so like here's my company logo here. So if I grab the path from my hard drive for that, and I'm going to say IDP logo, and we'll have the your, uh, we'll call this one um, media file name. It's actually not a URL, create a string, paste the media file name there. And then I come back here. Now I'm gonna copy this code. And rather than this, have this be URL, have it be media file name. Now what we're going to do is what this is saying is if it's got a URL, pull the image from the URL. In this context, if the if I'm pulling the image from a local file name, I can do it this way. And I'll show you something more complex in just a minute. So now if I do that, now I'm pulling in the logo from, from the local file of the hard drive. So there's just tons and tons of ways to, to, to be able to manipulate and manage that. And I'll just show you a little something a little bit more where kind of an end state for this would be is something like this. That were my slides. Uh, got another demo there here. So while I'm looking for this file, anybody comments? Uh, yeah, David, Eddie, you got a question? Uh, this is to Mark, a combination of uh, Michael, go back to the place where you are putting a name on something, a label on something. Okay, uh, where am I going? Well, right here. well, at some point, there's an upper box where you type in a name. Yeah, like here. What do you mean, like the name of a note, or what? 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 what something are you referring to? Oh, it's not this one. I mean, I think you're typing the name of a variable. Typing the name of a variable. Oh, you mean like this? The that? Yes, 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 yes. yes. So this is the question to Mark Bernstein. Is it possible to have something grab control of that upper box under the umbrella of controlled vocabulary? Well, uh, uh, you... I have no idea what you're referring to. So just so, just so we're clear what this is, this is the well, ability- uh, in, 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 the, in, in the example, I'm only interested in the upper box. So it went back to uh, a point where, uh, everybody mistypes uh so no, no 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 but my point being david is that's this is just a way of it's a this is a shortcut way of creating uh user generated attributes you can also do that here right so i can go here and create new attributes so this is just a way of 
have telling Tinderbox to create an attribute for me. Okay. I want to know if a, in the context of the task you're trying to uh, uh, do, uh, can in that naming an attribute, can I apply a controlled vocabulary? I don't want a full Oxford dictionary of aardvark to xylophone. I want the language only of the accounts receivable system I'm working on. Does that make any sense? It does, but I would, I would, I would, argue, in this context, I would argue no, right? Because this is whatever you want to be typing into it. And you're asking the application to constrain what can be typed in that box. Absolutely. And that, that's, doesn't, that doesn't I, I, seem like something Tinderbox is built for. Well, that's what I'm asking. Can, can control somehow be grabbed even either post while you're in the act of doing it, or once you've saved the, uh, it's like kind of well. By the non-reaction, I, I see I'm off. I'm off. Uh, off I, I, I I. This is a list of the the potential values in the displayed attribute table, or any of the five hundred and twenty-four built-in attributes, plus any user attributes that you have, plus any user attributes that you don't have yet, but you want to make right now. Correct. So the, the attributes embedded, I, I think of the attributes embedded in Tinderbox are the reserved words. Yes? No. They're, they're variable names. They aren't reserved words. Mm. So, so the point be the point being, David, is so if you look here, for example, if I come in here, Tinderbox has 524, I believe you said, Mark, system attributes. Like color is a system attribute. Yeah. So I can't, you know, that's an attribute. Um, displayed attributes um, is is an attribute, right? So there's 524 system attributes. As a right. user, I can't use those names. Those names are reserved by the application to do its thing. I understand. Well, that's just now, as a, as, but as a user, I now can create an infinite number of user attributes. And what I hear you, what I think you're asking is, is there a way to tell Tinderbox to not allow me to create any other words other than these? And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Then well, the this, I'm, Dave, I'm trying David, to... doesn't this get back to your idea that people call the same thing different names and you're trying to um create some um consistency and orderliness to all of this so that there's a almost like not good language but a formulary of words and they can only choose the, from that list of words outside of the assigned attributes you have outside of the system attributes out so they're basically software is a basic the way i think of it which is obviously difficult for me to express Software is basically a verb and noun construct. So the 524 attributes that Tinderbox has, I think of as verbs. Something's gonna, ha you use that, that string of characters and something's gonna happen. Action, verb. The challenge comes when I, the user who am, I mean, this is trying to avoid the future you not understanding what the hell you wrote yesterday. The nouns of what the, are the things that I make up on the fly. And I want to control that, a controlled vocabulary to say, I'm trying to document this 45 year old accounts receivable system. And I only want to use language relevant to accounts receivable. I see Mark right. coming. I'm not sorry. And, and, and so use language. Yeah, you don't, don't write a sonnet. <laughs> I, I I mean, why why do you need to restrict your vocabulary? Who's first? Whose vocabulary are you restricting? The person who is currently working on the forty year old document that they do not understand. Right, forty year old collection of documents. Well, and got, so, got so and they're working for you in some way, manner or sense. Again, I missed the first part. They're working for you. 
they being what the the, the, the the person whose vocabulary of attribute names you want to limit the, the unfortunately they're already limited by the decades of uh past and future use who, that have trod through this collection of, of software okay i i david yeah. are you are you kind of saying that as there's been different itinerations of this development that you're trying to maintain consistency across terminology yes that's my objective and pardon my simplistic brain but a list of all of the terms on a piece of paper that people had next to them that wouldn't do it not on paper well I, I, again and we've talked about this before i think we're getting a bit aside you okay. know what what i would argue uh in that context david is you know remember you are the author of your tinderbox file it's up to you to put into what into it whatever you want that, that's if you, my if, problem but if you want to create a uh, a, a uh, we've glossary, talked, that's a good word, yep, right? So, you know, you go here, you create glossary, you know, and item one, no, or, no, sorry, item. Okay, um, right? you 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 define your terms, right? And so you do that now. But I'm trying to define the terms to, you know, my future you who is not me. Right. So now, now, in the con now, in the context of user generated attributes, that's why we have a description box here, too. Right now, I personally never use this because I'm lazy, but this is, you know, image alt texts, you know, is intended to be used this way. Right. Right. And so you can put in the description box of the attribute that you can create for your future self. And then what Mark Bernstein has done, which is awesome is in our, um, he's opened this up to action code or in, in, and into its own attributes. So I can pull this description into say a glossary of terms of all of my attributes that I've created uh, within my Tinderbox file to basically self-documenting my Tinderbox file. And so then I could actually create a whole section that says, here are all of the attributes in my Tinderbox file. Here are their names, here are their types, here are their defaults, here are their suggestions. And here's the description I've gave them and why and how I'm using them. Okay. Right. So you could be doing that too. So you could be self-documenting your Tinderbox file as you go about doing it. I'm too lazy though. I don't do that. Um, well, just, this is, that's you. 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 You're 99.9999 percent of the world's population. Yeah. And uh, uh, the I'm basically trying to figure out how to compile on the nouns. Tinderbox compiles on those 524 attributes. Use one of these attributes or get lost. No, you wouldn't. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, again, we're getting astray. The 520 okay. attributes are system attributes for Tinderbox. You as the user get to create an infinite number of your own user generated. I don't attributes. like the word my, infinite. My, my, I have 600 attributes in one of my files, right? It's just, I can create attributes on the fly. I do it constantly. Would you have, what would happen day. if you handed that off to someone else? Uh, if my code's not documented, they're not going to understand my code. But you know, majority of the times I'm not giving my stuff for somebody else because it's for self-production. Chuck, let me ask Chuck a file. Uh, let, let's check. Well, uh, I hate to say this, but I sort of understand what Dave Eddy is getting at. Um, I have a similar issue in that, you know, I'm dealing with a uh, machine constructed set of variable names uh, that I want to turn into attributes. And so I can do that um, with custom code that does uh, convoluted explode operation. But the one area I've run into issues in is I also have sources for the descriptions. And as I recall, there wasn't a way within Tenderbox to feed the description field. So if you had the attribute name, you create the attribute, but you couldn't stuff the uh, uh, description into that description box you've got up on the screen right now. And I don't know whether that's something other people would be interested in or not. I mean, I, I found some workarounds for it, but it's manual and, and somewhat labor intensive. Um, maybe that's something that-, that Yeah, I mean, when you're creating fixed. an attribute using action code, it would be nice if you could populate the description field. I don't know if it, you can't do that or not. I don't remember. Right. The, the other thing that would be nice to, to populate would be the suggested field. Because in many cases, I've got you know, a, a variable that can only have a certain set of values, and I'd love to be able to set 
put those values into that. So I understand the problem. Um, and I can see some use cases and it might be that just improving the, um, the way that we can manipulate the full internal dictionary of attributes might be helpful. And it's, it's sort of partly there today with, what is it? Um, I'm forgetting what the uh, action code is that allows you to get at that stuff, document or something like that. But at any rate, I, ju I just throw it out as, as another variant on what David is talking about. And maybe there's something that um, exists or that we could leverage to, to do that. Well, what, what, what I hear David saying is, allow me to create a, a, a list of terminology that constrains my future self from mistyping something or entering in something that's not in some other list somewhere. Right. And I assume okay. that David has a source for getting all of those terms. Right. But that assumes as, those as, terms as are there. Are in, in another context. I, yeah. I, I have a the the data elements, which I guess this term calls attributes. The data element list for a three thousand year old banking application, mm -hmm. three thousand years old, and uh, so it's about eight hundred full attributes, which typically have multiple account policy number. That's a single attribute, three three words. The actual words used out of those eight hundred compresses down to about 300. So my point is, I mean, 300 fragments, account and policy and number are individual fragments. Well, is number consistently used? Probably not in most applications. Prime example, people think social security. We all say social security number, it's not a number. You ever add up a column of social security numbers? You ever do math on social security? Yeah, um, okay. we're, we're, we're getting this straight. I, I hear what you're saying, Thank but you. remember, this is a tool for yourself and all that. And we're, let's not, let's be careful not to, not, not to go too far down a rabbit hole. Uh, let me go back to- let I me have a suggestion. The, yeah. Just briefly, David, I think you have got an incredible book idea. And that's where I would suggest channeling this. And it's going to be called David Eddy's Gripes. I think that things like that it's a social security number that's not a number. I think that's gold. And I strongly encourage you to collect these, curate them. You might even want to do it in Tinderbox and really put it out there because you have got so many genuine gems that unfortunately are conundrums. These are uh, wines. These are wines. I'm not going to call these. Are, this is David okay, wines. Wine. I like that too. Just a thought. Hey. All right, but let's let's go let's go back to um, the, our our, uh, our our image project here. So, again, going back to Bruce's comment, you can write templates to output anything you want. It does, and it doesn't have to be HTML. You can output JSON. You can out, out, output Markdown. You can output anything else. What we've been doing up to this point is demonstrating how you can use standardized HTML code to output an image. Um, you know, uh, through a, through an HTML template, and and you get that. Now, let me show you a little bit more. Uh, what I'll call I don't want to call it advanced, but a, a different approach in doing this. So here's another PowerPoint or a Tinderbox file that I have, and you'll notice here um, I've got a a template I call slide, and this template says you know, and let me just explain what's happening here, and then and then I'll we'll walk through it. This template is basically saying. You know, what I want you to do is figure out where in the, uh, you know, what is, so what's happening up here is this template saying, what's the number of your previous note? What's the number of your next note? And so that I can then use that information to create navigation here. And I'll show you how that outputs in just a minute. And then when you're looking at the specific file, um, I'm doing a recursive uh, element here that says, you know, if you're an image, what I want you to do is grab the ID number for that media file and then use the template media two to insert that media file or not, not shouldn't say if you're an image, if you're what I'm designating as media image, audio, or video, I want you to it, it, you know handle that image audio vi or video using the T media template. So if I'm looking at this slide, 
what this does is it actually creates a presentation like navigation within Tinderbox. And that you'll see here, there's media. This is an audio file. This is a video. Yeah. You know, and this is an image. To, so that I don't have to be kind of redoing it all of the time. Essentially, what I did is if you go up here, I've got a template I call, uh, I've got a prototype I call P Media. And I've got an attribute called Media File Name. And I've got an attribute called Media Width. I also have an attribute called media alt, which is referred from alt text. And if you come up here, oops, and I let my tinderbox crash on me. Let me open that up again. So if you come up here and I look at this media file, here is the file name for that particular image. Here is the file name for that video. Here is the file name for that audio. In this context, all of these files are locally sitting on my hard drive as opposed to on YouTube or somebody else's website. Um, and then what I'm also doing, I've got, I've got more complex stuff in this template. Like if you're a comment, I don't want you to see it. You'll also note too, in the way I built the template, it's showing me the next note is note C, not comment or not knowledge is power because this is a PowerPoint template I want the children to be the basis of the template, and I want the navigation to be based on what's next in the, in the sibling order. So there's complexity in what I'm doing here. But you'll notice that's how I'm getting Tinderbox to dynamically choose the media file. So now if I go back to my media, you'll see here I'm saying the type of this media is an image. The type of this media is a video. The type of this media is an audio file. So now if I go look at my media two file, look what's happening. I'm basically saying, if you're an image, use the image source tag methodology to include that into the file. If you're a video, then use video embedding. Now here's interesting. If you're a video, use in video embedding. If you're a video embed, I want you to import the YouTube methodology of doing that. And then if you're actually, I've got something else for other learning management systems that I use as well. And if you're audio, use the audio controls. So this one media template that I've uh, I, I've developed allows me to use a single uh, have a single prototype I call media and depending what values I prop I, I populate within that media file it dynamically uh, generates within the output the handling that I need for that particular type of content and so I'm, in this context I'm doing it in the per, in the in the in the perspective of you know creating a presentation file in Tinderbox but this could easily be a website. It could be easily be a Word document, whatever you want. So coming back to Bruce's original issue, um, it sounds like you could easily provide additional ADA controls to Absolutely. support um, ADA compliance to a template like that. Absolutely, you can do like, and again, this blue is not ADA compliant, I pretty much guarantee you. Um, so <laughs> you, you could be feeding ADA compliant color schemes into this, into that output, into that template. And then when you hit export, that's gonna be exactly what the website's gonna get. For my part, this is really actually interesting and helpful. This, um, this covers a lot of ground. Okay. And then while I'm at, while I've got this here too, uh, You'll notice here where I've got this list equals as children. So if I'm doing in, doing this, you'll see the children go away. And if I change the template, and again, this is the power of Tinderbox when you're using templates. Let's say I change the template to a, a HT, normal HTML output. Here's the normal HTML output. No, 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 I don't want this as a... Now let's say uh, if I go back to my... I've got other code that processes these children as um, bullets. So then if I go up here and I say, no, 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 I want the children of this note to be listed as um, as bullets. Uh, oh yeah, that's not in that code. So if I now go here and I say, I want the children, uh, th these children in this slide to be listed as bullets, I now get bullets. And then I say, no, 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 I want it. I actually want this to be a numbered list. Now I get a numbered list. No, what I, you know, what I, I want also what I want to do is include the text of the children. So I click that box 
And now the text of the children are showing up too. So again, this is just the power of, you know, using the, the if then statements within your template to determine what tinderbox ends up serving into, into your output. So super powerful. You have effectively can end up doing anything you want. Yeah, Dave Rogers. Yeah, I wanted to add a, a couple things because I realized these things uh, get published and I didn't want to come off sounding as though I did was not in favor of making accommodations for visually impaired people. I was just expressing my frustration at trying to figure out how to write uh, alt text that is meaningful to someone who is visually impaired. No, uh, no, having said yeah, that. I, I think you can properly said, proper. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. But go ahead. Well, and, I, and and just out of curiosity, I inspected the element on that image on that page, and it's possible I don't understand how inspect element works, but I, I couldn't find the alt text. In any well, event. Where, um, where, on this page? Yeah, yeah. So, In any event, that's not my point. That's, that's, not, that's not my point. My point is, is that when I use, yeah, go ahead and, and it comes up. Do you find alt text in that mess there? It's actually funny if the ADA compliance guy doesn't have alt, but uh, I, I, is there a control F for the inspector? I couldn't figure that out. Well, I, I right mouse clicked and I just hit inspector. Inspect. Yeah, that's what I did. But I mean, how do you find it in that soup? Well, uh, and then you click on the image. And then depending yeah. on where you click, that's where the inspect comes up. That's where I looked and I can't find alt text that describes right here. that. Alt decoding? No, asyncs. Yeah, I looked at so yeah. irony is the fifth yeah. fundamental force of the universe. Uh, but going back to Tinderbox and images. So I use photos to manage my uh, image photo library. And I want to export from photos to my blog. And I have an Apple script that does that. There is no alt text um, uh, field in photos, but there is a caption field. So photos gives you the opportunity to give you, your image a title and a caption. So I use those two fields, which are accessible in Apple script and photos to give the image a title, which becomes the, the blog <laughs> post the note name for the image and the caption. Uh, I just keep the same nomenclature It's called photo caption as the attribute in Tinderbox, but on the export template, for the uh, alt text, it uses the, uh, the, the, the the attribute photo caption. And I just write all my photo captions as uh, descriptions of what the image, what I think the image is. Um, and looking at some photographs in a book recently and what the captions are, in many cases, they simply are a recapitulation of, of what the image is depicting, adding some additional context. Uh, so from time to time, I'll do that as well. Uh, but <laughs> so there, is so no alt text, there is no alt text in uh, in Flickr either. So that when you export from photos to Flickr, it'll take the caption with it. And so people with visually impaired who might be visiting Flickr would have that, that description in the caption that the screen reader would catch. So you found it? Well, I found it for the cat. Cute orange kitten. Okay, but on. not for not. So, not so for it looks logo. like he didn't do it. He didn't apply the alt text for his his main blog's image, which is kind of ironic. But you know, hey, just say yeah. Irony is the fifth fundamental force of the universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for my Nobel Prize. Please notify the committee. <laughs> I'm standing by. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so the answer to your question, Bruce, which I think is a great one, is yes, and it just goes down to what is it that you want to populate? Because, you know, um, ADA compliance is just a set of rules and text that you need to be passing to the code. And as we've demonstrated, you can pretty much do that completely in, 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 in entirety with Tinderbox. It's funny, as, as you were talking, I was listening, but curiosity got the better of me. So I started searching for a moment under AI alt text generators. Well, you can, no surprise, you can have your pick of, of what you want. Um, so uh, analyzes your image and gives you suggested alt text. Uh, yes, <laughs> and I suspect, I suspect with the uh, Chat GBT demonstration we did last week, which I don't think you were actually on the call. No, I had to. Um, I had to work. I had nineteen kids playing miniature golf. Yeah. So um, let me just for fun, we'll 
demonstrate that real quickly so you missed it. Thank you. Um, Boy, I feel special. Um, so here is, let me pull up my Tinderbox file here. Where is it? There it is. So here's one of my Tinderbox files. And if I scroll, blah, blah, blah. Right. So go ahead and ask me a question. Um, ask you a question. Uh, yeah. Well, how about what um, are the yeah. top? What are the top 10 considerations for ADA compliance? I was something like that. Great. That's just what I was going to say. Okay. And then I check that little box. And so what we've done is we uh, we're working with Roger and Alexander. We have a Python script that, that we wrote that is now um, considerations. Let's do it again. Uh, that are, is now going out to, um, to uh, chat. So the Python script went out to chat GBT and then returned this to us. Yeah, it 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 truly is is frightening, and it's always confident. It's always confident, but it's so often wrong. But that's a whole other thing. Exactly. We were talking about it being a professional bullshitter last week, uh, and it it absolutely is. Well, it I I asked it um, to create a six lesson series for teaching teenagers about technology, and I had already written up a bunch of stuff. There was a good eighty percent overlap. Yeah. But the but the twenty percent where it doesn't overlap and it's either totally wrong or it completely made it up and doesn't actually exist. Yeah. So accept but verify. Yeah, it's filtering out. It's the pain. So before I shut off the screen, anybody else want to? Are we done with this? Does anybody else want to see or talk any more about this whole image thing? Okay. That looks like that conversation has run its course. Um. What else? We also had a, a in the ch we could do if no one else has any other topics. Um, there was some elements on the forum last week about can Tinderbox be useful for writing in Markdown or not, and we can demonstrate that it actually can uh, very easily. Um, we can go through that really quick if people are interested. Uh, I see Philip nodding his head. Anybody else have any? comments and all right a bunch of people showed up while uh while i had my screen shared so hi mark anderson and uh philip and art good to see you um shall we look at that okay given that we're not getting any other verbal uh reaction we'll go ahead and do that so share screen Okay, so let's talk about what Markdown is. And um, Markdown was developed. What was the guy's name again? I keep forgetting. That invented Markdown or proposed it. John Gruber. John Gruber. John Gruber, yeah. right? Um, so John Gruber and John created Mark uh, Common Mark, if I'm not mistaken, or just Markdown in general. Markdown, uh, the whole thing. The whole, okay, so John Gruber creates creates this concept called Markdown. And since then, as is the case in the internet, um, you know, we'll often see that while well, Markdown must be some, you know, well-established, solidified standard that everybody agrees upon, and you will quickly realize that that is not the case, and there are tremendous dialects of Markdown uh, running around. Um, but having said that, um, there are a few Markdown engines um, that uh, are out there. One is called Common Mark. And another one is called Markdown, which I don't have the hand, uh, the um, URL handy for. But let's go ahead and we'll use the same demo for our Markdown demo. All right, and we'll call this one Common Mark. All right now, there are some general, uh, commonly accepted notations for Markdown. So Markdown is a is essentially a quick and dirty way of writing HTML markup. So in other words, if you're writing um, in HTML language, if you were to say, you know, H1 equals this is a heading one, you would say this. You would, you, you know, essentially by doing this syntax, you're saying 
everything in between the opening tag of heading one and uh, the closing tag of heading one, I want you to format as a heading one. And a heading one is either default defined in the in the in the browser as a certain font size and certain color, or it's going to be defined in your CSS files uh, to determine what you know what its appearance is going to be. But the the notation methodology is you're essentially saying, you know, hey web browser, I want you to you know, highlight this context with a, a mark one. Similarly, if you were doing things like an unordered list, you would say unordered list, and then you'd write Lee. Bullet one, Lee, bullet two, and then we'll just kind of, so an unordered list is a list of little round dots or little open squares, um, or, or and uh, as opposed to numbers one, two, three, four, five. And so if we're looking at a particular file, you're looking at this, and if we render that, there you go. I've got a heading one, I've got a heading two. If I copy this code, and I go like this, I've got a, a, a heading two because I'm not creative right now. I'll go like this, go like to, and by definition or standards of the internet, you know, heading two is slightly smaller in size than say a heading one. And that's how you do uh, HTML tagging. So we'll call this one HTML. Now, if you're gonna do common mark, markdown in Tinderbox, well, what is a heading one in commonplace markdown? Well, a heading one is a hashtag and you say heading one. And you ask yourself, well, what is a bullet? Well, a, a bullet is an asterisk. Right? So I've now created some bullets and I'll say here, heading two. And in markdown parlance, a heading two is a um, two hashtags. And if you wanted to add this a little bit more, if you underscore this is an italic and or this is an italic. Uh, is that right? Oh, yeah. And, or a single, like a single, if I'm not mistaken, a single bullet is italic, whereas a double one is bold. OK, so in other words, when you're writing in Markdown, this is a really quick way to be giving a notation of of of, st of style and appearance that you want in your output. Yes, Mr. Bruce. It's it's a, it's a go no go ahead and then I'll ask my question. This is actually more than just a quick and easy way to write HTML. If you look at this, you could read this. Yes, you can. I've that's part, that's part of the reason why no, you... um, journalists like this is it's easier to read. Well, Sorry. I've been using this for the last 20 years, and 99% of the time, I never rendered it as anything else. Where yeah. I work, we use this the right specifications, and why? Because it's all in text, it's easy to read, don't have to render it, and so on. And, and it's, it's easy to parse really when you need to parse it and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, uh, Mr. Bruce. So, in unordered lines with um, bullets... I believe there's, I forget, three or four different options. You can have it be the, the circle, you can have a square, you can have nothing, some, something else. Um, right. so, is there a way within um, Markdown to um, to create something similar, to, to change the, the default options? I think so, just a minute, let's, let's test real quick. Um, all right, let's tell, well, yeah, well, yes and no. So let's let's test this real quick. Let me get to that in a minute. So you'll see here I, I've written this I've written this copy here. Yeah, you see that. Now, if we're going to go and render that in preview, preview is going to kind of do its best to try to figure it out. But this is not Markdown, and um, you know Tinderbox is just kind of guessing at this point. Now in Tinderbox parlance, uh, if we go to our inspector and we go to system and we type HTML preview as in everything in tinderbox uh tinderbox um you eats its own dog food in other words it uses the values of its uh, of system attributes to actually have the um the um the system perform uh the way it wants to do it and so um in this attribute html preview command which just for sake of ease we'll type this right here okay uh, the default of HTML preview command is empty. So Tinderbox is going to be rendering, I guess, with the WebKit HTML engine 
uh, and for and uh, Mr. Bernstein, jump in if I'm wrong. But I believe by default, it's using the uh, HTML WebKit engine. Um, now, if I go in here and I'm going to override that, now what I'm doing by by specifying mark common mark uh, in the HTML preview command, what I'm essentially now saying telling Tinderbox is I'm like, hey, hey Tinderbox, I don't want you rendering this page with um, uh, with the WebKit. I want you rendering this page with common mark. Moreover, uh, there's an, one other attribute we want to add here is markup markup text. So by default, Tinderbox assumes that this is markup text, meaning that it's HTML. So another word for HTML is, is markup text. If I uncheck that, what we're now saying is, hey, Tinderbox, this is not markup text. This is some other form of text, presumably mar um, mark using markdown. Uh, and I want you to render, therefore, this text with the element called common mark. And just so we can get familiar with the uh, inspector, um, you'll notice here where it says markup text. If I check that box and I come back here, that's now true. If I uncheck that box and I come back and refresh, it's now false. So you can actually control the markup text uh, value, true or false, um, through the inspector or through action code as well, obviously. So now watch what happens. So now what I'm saying is Tinderbox, uh, this is not markup text. This is some other form of text, presumably marked down. Um, I'm going to have you render it using common mark. And here is the, um, the, the my common mark language here. Now watch this. If I go ahead here and now render it. I get a heading one, I get a heading two, I get my bulleted list, I get italic, italic, I get bold. And if you look at the output, I've got um, HTML, right? So Tinderbox is rendering the HTML for us through the engine of common mark. The other engine, and you'll notice here, the HTML preview command is ac actually on the export function as well. So I can also just do it here. I can also mark down, is it marked? I don't remember what it is marked is it marked down what is the other um mark down not mark down not camel case uh just lowercase right so mark down like that so i can also the other engine that tinderbox uses is marked down so if you go here and you look at there now it's marked down versus common mark and you'll see that that is now rendering and it's rendering uh because i applied the html uh, template, I'm also getting the images that we included in the HTML template. Now, here's an, here's another interesting kind of uh, fun thing about, about that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to call this one too, just so we can do that. And I'll fix this real quick because I want to remove something while we're at it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to remove these source files out of our HTML2 template. And I'm now going to change the template that it's associated with this one to HTML2. So now that when we render, we're getting our pure uh, uh, markdown without it. Now in markdown, I can also include images. So if I do, if I want to include a URL, let me show you. Let's go back to our web page we were looking at before. Where's our ADA compliance web page here? So here's our ADA compliance web page. So there's other things you can do with Markdown as well. So let's say I'm going to go ahead and grab that URL. And in here, if I do this, ADA compliance tips. This is the only one, this is the only way I do URLs anymore. Um, and I'm, I'm going to show you a little tip here too. If I'm now rendering this image, this is the way to essentially do the same thing, which is this, a href ref equals, and this is not going to work, and I'll show you why in a minute. Okay, so if I do this, and the reason why it's not going to work is smart quotes is first, the first reason why it's not going to work is you want to have in your text smart quotes off, refresh, and I fix that. Okay, so if you're looking here, this ahref uh, notation for doing an anchor link in HTML in Markdown, it's equivalent. You know, this is the equivalent way of doing a reference link. So if I go like that, you'll see that I have now both these elements there, and they're both showing me 
um, the associated uh, uh, HTML output. Now, the other thing, sometimes that doesn't work. And so what you'll also want to do is turn off, and this drives me crazy. So I always turn this off for myself, just in the way I might do this, is smart links. So you'll see that Tinderbox is automatically generating that into a clickable link. Well, what if I don't want that? And especially with certain output, um, you don't want that. So if I go in here and now and remove that link by turning off smart links, I can now get Tinderbox or deleting the links that are in there. I now have Tinderbox not automatically generating those into links for me, um, which in invariably, and then you'll still see, but yet when it does its output, it actually converts them into cl clickable links. So that is super, super helpful. And the other reason why I like doing it this way is, uh, especially if I were to copy this link, I'm gonna create a new note. Here's the other reason why, if I, just co if I copy this link from the browser and just paste it right into, um, right into the note, um, a lot of the times here, let's copy this, let me copy a link. Uh, here, copy this link, paste. So if, uh, okay, it's now working for some. Let me see. All right, I'll do. I'll do that. I'll I'll do what I was trying to demo in a second. Um. Actually, I know what I'm trying to do. If I do this, let's say I copy a paragraph of text from that from this. Let's say I copy this paragraph of text from my ADA site, and I create a new note and paste that in. All right. The, pro the problem I have is this link is now buried into the RTF layer of um, um, of the Tinderbox note, and I can't really action against that. So quickly, what I'll often do is I'll, I'll hit edit link. I will then go in head here and add in. Well, first and foremost, what I'll do is I'll format the text like this. I'll add in the markdown notations around that, copy in the link like this. And so then that way, and then I'll remove the links. So that way I'm able to have, I'll be able to paste in my, my RTF, but then I'll quickly convert it to a markdown URL. So that way, if I ever want to you know, pull this URL out for any other purposes or use it, it's there for me to be able to do so, um, which is a really, really helpful way. And that's another important element of using, um, using uh, uh, you know, markdown as a, as a notation. So, You'll see here what we've done. I, I, I want to put in a quick caveat. Oh, please, uh, please, please. I, I, I think that, that there's, a, there's, there's a point to this. And Markdown advocates like uh, great innovations, but the um, built-in links do not bury the uh, link in RTF. First, there is no RTF. Okay. Uh, but but they don't bury the link. It's exported beautifully. If you don't use markup, uh, it, it exports just fine. I, I know it doesn't fit particularly well with your preview centric mode of using Tinderbox, but that's not the only way to use Tinderbox. I want to make it clear to uh, viewers uh, that there there is no reason not to use style text. In fact, style text has been developed at great length for very good reasons. It's used all over the world. It's far more popular than Markdown. It's by no means training wheels or Microsoft or for stupid people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and Mark, I'm so thank you very much for introducing that. That's not you know the reason why I again. Totally agree with you. And I'd, I'd say probably 90, 99% or, or the vast majority of users are that method to which you were, um, uh, why is that disappeared here? Let me paste that back in. Uh, that, that you're right. 99% of users are going to do it this way. Um, to your point and the, re and the reason why I've gone down that path and there's a very tactically, technical and specific reason why I do it is um, I like, you know, I, I, I do a lot of rendering of the of the points and um, there is Apple script that you can run that will automatically pull that URL out of the styled text. Um, there are- well, You don't need any to... Apple script. Uh, Tinderbox does that and has done it for 20 years. Yeah, I get it. 
but yeah, action action code has a difficult time pulling that. And you don't need uh, well, okay. Right. So, but no, and again, I'm not I'm not arguing, I'm not saying it's wrong, Mark. What I'm saying is there are certain instances where if you want to run operations on stuff that's within styled text, there are there are alternatives that people can use. That's all I, that's all I'm pointing out. But I agree with you, probably the vast majority of users don't have to go to the level of detail that I use. And, and wouldn't want to, nor, nor would ever want to think about it. Uh, Mr. Anderson, could, would you comment on that at all? Um, I'm just looking up. So I mean, one of the things is uh, there is no, there was a while where smart links were slightly disconnected from the main thing, but I, I, I that's long since passed. So uh, the, the whole point about smart links is they just adopt links they find where they make the, the visible anchor text in the original source um that they've got into the anchor text that you see the link is there if you open browse links the url feature the url that it's pointing to is there and i was just looking up as you asked in i'm sure i put it in atb ref and i suspect if you go to uh each link where are we um i won't well i won't try and do it live but i'm 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 99 certain that you can now actually iterate through the links in a note so that the, the point that you can't get it i don't think holds i think the big problem with markdown is you know it's it's the big thing at the moment give it another year it'll be something else it'll be yaml or it'll be whatever you know to the man with a hammer everything is a nail and that's the problem with markdown in conceptually in my mind is that there are lots of people who use tinderbox in all sorts of other ways without ever being troubled with the notion of markdown the 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 <clears throat> The problem at the moment is it's very popular in the PKM space where people are just rediscovering something that we used to call hypertext and <laughs> claiming they found some new nirvana. And so you watch. So basically what you're seeing is is basically a wiki technology with a bit of markdown on top. And this is this is, you know, the new gold dust. Um, I, I bet you give it another year, it'll be something else. So I don't mean to be unkind, but I mean, the point is, <laughs> I, I, I it's just another thing the the, the Dane. And it's, there's a, it's something we're all prone to is assume the thing that we do every day is what everybody does. And it just right. isn't, so absolutely I, I, isn't I, true. I, yeah. And I do want to call it. Well, that's call not quite true, though. Go ahead. It, it's not quite true. The world I work in, I'm a professional software developer. We use it all the time. Why? Because it is e easy to read relative to HTML, but more importantly, it's text. We can be able Sorry, to but text left and right. Roger. I wasn't arguing against that. You're absolutely right, and 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 I yeah. and I, I totally agree. But, but the point is that, um, well, a, a simple fact is probably I don't know what percentage of Tinderbox users are software developers. So, for instance, there there, there are probably not, like here, and they probably show up less here. But you know, doing things like they're working in the humanities, they're doing basic close reading and annotation, they're working probably entirely in RTF, and they probably never even use HTML export. If they use export, they do it as style text. No, no. No, no, and that, no, that's, right. that's, I, I, that's I the problem that. when we try and give when we try and give guidance across the piece. Uh, and 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 I'm I would just say, in, in case I appear otherwise, I have absolutely, I absolutely have no issue, no problem with using Markdown. Indeed, you know, I use it in various places. Uh, it's just, it's just the difficulty, and it's it's definitely been a, an issue. It, it's it's the current sort of, it, it was white and everything like a Zettelkast, and the current the current starting meme of people turning up in the uh in the community in the forums is that why is why doesn't everything use markdown well the answer is because not everyone uses markdown you can well, use it well and, and well, that's well, I, I did want to come back to one more point though real quick well, uh, hang on hang on a second quite kind of quite honestly i would prefer to use style of text in tinderbox and generate markdown so i can hand it to somebody else or check it into a code repository if appropriate. Um. Yeah, but I, I, and, and I and I did want to come back to uh, one other point. So, and Mr. Bernstein rightfully so said this, and that you'll notice here in style text, I'll start calling it RTF. So, so in style text, there's this clickable link. I can click on that and that opens up this website that works great. Um, now, Mark pointed out a point is when I preview that though, that clickable link or that link is not, um, uh, come on, why is it doing that? Come on. Oh, that's interesting. I just clicked stuff around and those two notes just got deleted. Interesting. And I just lost the other note there too. Let me, uh, 
Interesting. Okay. I'm not sure what I did, but um, that just happened. Uh, the uh, the point being is that when you are previewing that, that note, and I don't have it now to recover, so we'll get back to that in a minute, um, that when you're in preview, that link is not clickable, uh, which is fine if you don't need that in that preview. And that's just a, um, a, another comment that we made. Uh, while we're at it, and I'll just finish out this one thing. If you wanted to also then render an image using Markdown, you could do that as well using the same syntax. And if we go back to my hard drive and grab up that image that I was showing you earlier, like my logo, and I'll grab this copy path. So if I go ahead here and I say IDP logo, right? So what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, Tinderbox, using the co common mark rendering engine, um, name this link IDP logo and then link it to this picture. And by putting the explanation point in the beginning, that tells Tinderbox that this is an image. So now I get an image in there. That's the other way to do it. Now, here's something that's really, really fun. Let me show you this. So if I go down here and I'll now call this Pandoc. Um, there are other um, interesting comments. So if I were to also do this, so in common mark, this so this is a table. This is a way of writing a table in mark uh, markdown, but you'll see that table doesn't render. So common mark and markdown don't render tables. But if you're using Pandoc, and I'll grab one of my other files here and grab the Pandoc. So just like here where I'm telling Tinderbox to use Markdown or Common Mark, if I type paste in my Pandoc path, I can now ask Tinderbox now to render this Markdown using um, Pandoc. And at which case, uh, and if I did it right, um, I did a different demo for this. Oh, let me apply the, let me, let me apply this real quick. The types markdown. I'm just gonna do this real fast. To see if that works. Okay, you'll see now it actually does render that table. So there are ways. So uh, using common mark and markdown, those engines don't actually render piping tables, um, but Pandoc will render a piping table uh, language. So this is just to kind of complete the story. So, and, and to the point that people are out there saying you can't do Markdown in Tinderbox, that's absolutely wrong. You can if you want to. But to Mark Bernstein's point and Mark Anderson's point, the vast majority of, prob of people may or may not want to. Um, Actually, and, and, and that doesn't matter. It's whatever yeah. you want to use or what works for you. The, the, the table the table example is also good um, as to mention another thing that trips people up is APML, because I don't think there's a single app that actually uses strictly the APML published format. Basically, most people follow Omni Outliner's extended version of it because it was written for it was written for outlines that had no text. It just they were literally were outlines where the text was the title. And actually, you'll see that in Omni Outliner because the text of the note is everything after the first line slash paragraph of the first column of the note. Uh, and they they found a way around that, and 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 so this this is this is this is actually the other problem when 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 a, a format gets popular because so you know markdown's hot at the moment. OPML used to be sort of quite hot, and, it's, and they're they're all still around. But the, the me too nature of a lot of um, small app development, you know, small utility development, is that um, everyone goes for the Rach Motel approach. So I want my app to consume anything that the other app will consume. And I, and I haven't got time because it's expensive to build export, um, which is a shame. I mean, well, because one of the joys that everyone, to me, one of the things that's so overlooked about Tinbox is just how good it is at taking in information and, and, and putting it out. Um, and it's a rod for its own back because everyone turns up and complains that I can't do this. And it turns out you can it just takes a little effort. What we're really saying is, it's why can't it do it automatically? Because the answer is, it can't guess everything. It doesn't know if you don't tell it, and it, it, if you give it some exotic sort of edge case to a format, it may struggle because you're not using the format. Uh, and so we, we we tend to see, you know, poster name OPML markdown or something, and we just assume that whatever the last app gave us is actually valid and canonical for the format. And as a long time 
data plumber, I would say that's just not true. <laughs> Until you know it is. Oh, by the way, one more thing before we close out, which I think is important. So let's say another big important uh, activity of Tinderbox is explode. And let's say I wanted to explode this note um, at the hashtags. So what you can do is just you do, do explode. I go here, I type in the hashtags and I go like that. And I've now exploded this note at the, at the moment of where all the hashtags show up. Super helpful. Now though, let's say you wanted to explode this note at the asterisk. Now, because Tinderbox uses regex, you wanna escape that asterisk. Because if you don't, it won't work. So if you escape the asterisk, you'll now get Tinderbox effectively exploding the note at the asterisk. So that's just a little side note too, just for if people are trying to, if, if they are doing notation with this methodology and then later they want to explode, that's a little hint, uh, hint for people to, do, to to use. All right, and we are six minutes over. Uh, any last minute comments, thoughts, questions, observations? Queries? Mr. Mark, Mark, I haven't seen you guys in a long, I haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? Mark NL. Which uh, one? I was, I was trying to find uh, the right click here. Hello, hello. I have, uh, arrived be back to my uh, desk yesterday in the Netherlands. I do not intend to uh, disappear anytime soon. <laughs> so uh, I was traveling so much that it was kind of became really hard to participate uh, in airports and all to, to just participate in the forum. But I intend to uh, do that again on a regular basis, and I'm doing really well. So uh, that is fine. And uh, the only thing I must say is that I lost track of the timing because uh, I, I clicked on the email yesterday, and it was like 1,800 hours Paris time. Uh, that was on the, on the forum uh, website or whatever, the blog. But uh, you guys were already meeting for an hour when I entered, I think. But uh, yep. I'm not sure about it. All, all good. Alrighty then. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank see you. Ya.